Welcome back to another episode of the Search for Sustainability documentary series. You know, the feedback and positive comments and inspiration that we've heard from so many of you who've been watching this series has truly touched our hearts. And we're so grateful that it is impacting your life, your communities, your organizations, your schools, and your churches as much as we hoped it would. And in tonight's episode is very pertinent to that exact fact, simply because episode nine is all about sustainable energy, sustainable buildings, and sustainable systems and resources. Now, one thing about learning how to build our buildings better and more sustainably is critical to the sustainability of the human species on the planet, simply because our homes and our offices and the traditional buildings or the, the modern buildings, I should say, are completely unsustainable. They're very toxic to the planet and they're really inefficient. And so what kind of buildings does it take? What kind of material? How do we build them in a way that is harmonious to the planet, harmonious to our health, and sustainable long term. So we explore that in tonight's episode. We also explore various systems. We start touching on different systems and resources in a sustainable way and start considering and looking at practical ways that we can organize, gather, create, and distribute resources in a more sustainable way, as well as look at some of the systems that can be changed and go into some system thinking from a sustainability point of view, which is very powerful for all areas of your life, especially anybody in the leadership position. And in this episode, you get to hear from multiple viewpoints on these exact subjects that I think will potentially transform many industries, as long as the industry is looking at how do we do this long term in a way that is sustainable and beneficial for humans and the planet. And if we can look at it from that perspective, then I think we can create new systems and new buildings, new structures and new resources that will serve us rather than deplete us. So thanks again for tuning in and let's dive into tonight's episode. I think that just the age that we're in and the era that we're in, we, uh, we saw the benefits of industrialization and, um, and went full bore toward it. And now I think the life philosophy is coming a little bit back toward um, uh, something where we're, we're, we're trying to, to take care of our, our future generations. And, and the correlation, I think, is ki kind of transcends even environment, um, health, and sustainability. I think it, it, is, uh, it goes back to, um, to the fundamentals of our consciousness where we are born, and somehow it's miraculous that uh, nature actually provides everything that we need. And uh, being grateful for that and um, 
being uh, being aware of how um, basically about how of, of the bounty that we can be provided, provided that our actions kind of harmonize with with nature, um, is is a, is a great gift, and uh, and and so th there's almost. Uh, there's almost something that we have to wind the clocks back to learn what we were already given very, very long ago. So we're really interested in understanding, again, the materials and where they come from and respecting that. So knowing that with the production of new materials, virgin forest, uh, materials in the earth, whether it's minerals, um, Whatever the material is, is being extracted, more extraction and appropriation of the earth and the earth resources. And that is really a, such a pragmatic thing we see here. We understand that, for example, a radiator is made of iron, an iron ore. Somebody mined that ore, somebody produced that product. So why are we taking those products and dumping them when they can be reused, whoever it is? So people with resources and people without resources. What makes sense in terms of what's happening on our planet is that we respect that and that we take those materials and we reuse them so we don't need to go create new, new items and new materials. There's some cases where of course you need that, but oftentimes, and you can see, a warehouse, and this is the tip of the iceberg and we understand that. There could be a community forklift every couple blocks. That's the model, is that there is so much fabulous material and there's been an over commodification so we encourage people, if you don't need it, you don't need to get it. But you know what? You could bring in a lot of stuff you have in your house, bring it in, we'll put it up, somebody else will get it. And everything is so inexpensive. It's like you could just say, okay, I'm tired of this light fixture now. Well, instead of going to, to buy new product, you would come in here and for very cheap, you could get a fabulous new one. You know, it would feel like you've got something different in your home. You don't like the way it looks anymore. But what's so great is that you're not reproducing that material. You're not taking material out of the earth. And yet you're still creating jobs. There's still production. The materials have to come in. We have to clean them and take care of them and represent them for folks. So it creates a different cycle of sustainability than one based on both low-cost labor and extraction of the earth's resources. We say there is a much better way to do this about sustainability. You know, it's interesting how people talk about sustainability as if there's an alternative, as if there's another good alternative. They even call it alternative energy, right? Like alternative to unsustainable? <laughs> I mean, so, what kind of an, you know, it's like by definition, what kind of an alternative is that? So even in our language, you know, the sustainable green community, you know, feeling like, well, we're the little guy who's marginalized and, and then there's the big normal thing, which is unsustainable. And mm -hmm. people don't really want to look at that, you know. Mm -hmm. So even though it's been not smooth, like Mark says, we make a lot of mistakes. We find out their mistakes after we make them and we try <laughs> to make different mistakes next time, you know. <laughs> But we've got to, somebody needs to keep developing renewable energy and other alternatives to what's unsustainable. So we're, we're glad to be working on that. There's so many fronts that we have to make progress on. Greenhouse gases, ozone, waste, energy. There's so many things that we have to make um, gains on, and these are the areas that we're making gains. The city just purchased the largest municipal power buy for green power anywhere in the country. We just purchased where 35% of the city's power, and I mean all the city government buildings, from a wind farm in Pennsylvania. The rest of all the power that we purchase is through green power, but it's not as direct. But 100% of the power is renewable for the city buildings. But we want to get that 35% that's directly from wind power. We want to directly grow that. We're in the midst right now of putting 130 solar arrays on homes for people in low income. And their power bills will be dramatically dropped. But also they'll be generating green power. 
and then we're going to put another six million this year into primarily what we call community solar where you create it on buildings that maybe you don't own but you get the benefits of the decrease of your power bills and that'll be primarily for people again of lower income so we're going to see more aggression on that we're going to also see a um, we're going to see a zero waste plan and we hope to get that out within the next year it says how do we get to zero waste and how do we do that in a sustainable responsible way there's a lot of controversy around waste to energy burning your waste for power and we want to see really how do we do this in the most responsible way that is zero waste but also good for the planet i just put out a um, proposal for someone to do a study on how do we green all the fleets in DC. That's not just the government fleets, but how do we get green the fleets for universities, the fleets that operate in the city like the UPS trucks, FedEx, Peapod, and then how much gain do we get from each technology that's used. And it's not just electric vehicles, it's um, using ultra capacitors, it's different biofuels, um, in some cases, you know, we're not going to run our, our garbage trucks on battery power. So what's the gains that we get from going to compressed natural gas or something else? So the study will show how do we reduce our, the gases that really create an increase of ozone in the city. And that is something that we will see in the, within the next 12 months. The other is we're going to have a tree summit. There's nothing more magical than what one tree can do anywhere. So we, our tree canopy, our goal is to get it to 40%. I'm going to challenge the private sector to match the private, um, challenge the private sector to match the public sector's investment to increase the number of trees in the city. Currently, our goal is to plant 8,000 new trees a year. We're planting 11,000, and we need to get that up to 15,000. And so in doing that, I also have asked for heat maps because the ingredients in ozone is not just the gases, it's the, the heat that creates this toxic kind of mix that shortens our lives, impacts asthma, and really creates some um, bad health outcomes for folks. So, want to cool the city, obviously through um, green roofs, through green infrastructure, but also where we can with trees. You look at the, um, the natural air conditioners for the city, or the two rivers, that pass through our city, and then also Rock Creek Park with Rock Creek that comes through the city. Are there more things we can do with greening along the rivers so that we cool the water so that it removes as it gets, you know, as it pulls in heat and then moves out of the city and then cools again when it comes in? These are the natural air conditioners of the city. So trying to look comprehensively of how we cool the city through a green plan and people will see that. Then also, I really want to, you know, give kudos to DC Water. We've got a problem with, um, with combined sewer overflow where sewage with heavy rain events flows into our rivers, especially Anacostia. And that's the issue of equity. And they're putting in 13 miles of tunneling that will handle all overflows so that it doesn't flow into the river. Because the more that we can green the river, and get it to be a coolant for the city by keeping a healthy river that will have a greater impact on the health of the city. So that, those are things that we're going to see going forward and hopefully we're going to come up with some more initiatives regarding reducing trash. And I also want to say that I have a very close relationship to the folks that have my job in our neighboring counties, Montgomery County, Prince George's County, and also the environmental directors for the state of Maryland. And the more that we can work in concert together, the more we can um, make a greater impact. Really, the sum will be greater than its parts if um, I can get the neighbor, neighboring jurisdictions to join me in these initiatives. It's hard. It's hard for everybody. But at the same time, she, like she just said, you know, if we don't do it now, I mean, there has to be other ways that it's like... It's not now, when? Come on, man. Like, I wish this wasn't in plastic. Like, that's, that's as sustainable as I can think right now, man. Like, I'm trying to move off the plastic, B. As an artist, you know how bad it is for me to say I don't want to put out vinyl? And knowing how it's all fossil fuels, 
You know what I'm saying? Knowing about the plastics that's put into the CDs. You know what I mean? If you're not printing up paper QR codes and putting your album on it, you know what I'm saying? It's like you're not really a sustainable artist, regardless of how much money you're, you're being able to stay in business. And we're talking about how much plastic is just getting thrown into these landfills. Like, I feel like we ain't, if we don't address the ocean, the landfills, and the bioremediation we need in every hood, due to all the acid rain from all the pollution come from these power plants, giving everybody chemtrail issues and lung cancer, like, now that is, that's a whole nother reason, man. Like, it, and it doesn't even matter who you are, what you do. Like, the point is, is if the land is contaminated, like, where will you stand? Where will the artists paint? You know, where were the musicians sing? Like, literally, the land is everything. Not only does it grow your food, but, I mean, this is like we live on the land. Straight up. You know what I mean? And the same goes for the water. Like, so it's just common sense. Like, mm. you don't walk, if you walk into someone's house and they're not keeping order or they're just throwing their stuff everywhere, I mean, most people are like, that's kind of crazy, you know? Um, most of us, it's natural for us to like our environments to be, but we don't think of it outside of just our home. Some people don't think about it, you know, it outside of just their bodies. We're so focused on getting the raw foods or whatever, but all the packaging that goes into that, is it sustainable? Like, you know, is the water, like you said, the water bottles, like all of that. So it is beyond the body. It is beyond just the four walls of our house. Like it literally is the planet itself. Mm -hmm. And so how we address that is we start with ourselves. When we start to care about what we put into the body, um, more do we care about, you know, where it's coming from, where it's sourced from. Straight up, man. Like, it's, it's the real, man. Like, we need climate change right now, man. All these pol politicians out here pulling strings, and they know it. They already know, man. There's scientists who are out here making moves, man. We know it. everything. We have the technology. It's here. You know what I'm saying? All my students are singing it. Earth Guardians are singing it. Earth Amplified is talking about it. I mean, everybody's on it right now, man. We're aware. I think that the conversation this needs to happen. We, you know, we do need to localize our food. You know, we do need to think about how we can locally source, you know, our medicines, how we can locally source, you know, our conversation and really talking to each other around community development. Because once we can really get that set up, then all this other alternative currency, alternative food, alternative this and that, and all that other jazz, yeah, that will come in place. You know what I mean? But people focusing on that raw life, but they're still not thinking about the compassion that goes with it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And that's, I think that's the irony, bro. Like a lot of brothers and sisters, they'd be like, yo, man, I'm green in this. And I'm like, okay. You know, I know people in the hood, they, they want to be green, bro. If they could, if they, if they had solar panels on their house, they would take it. If they house would have the energy efficient, you know what I'm saying, with the gray water system and the, and the geothermal, come on, bro. Everybody want that, you know what I'm saying? Everybody wants that. It's not just the rich people. It just, you have to talk about free energy. We have to have the conversation around how we can actually develop everyone at the same time without really taking away from the people who feel like they're doing more work. They're doing more work because they're smart. You know, but at the same time, we can still educate each other. And that's what we're doing. You know, that's what hip hop is about. You know, that's why the struggle is so beautiful. Most of the world's wars are based on energy. And um, most of the pollution, I mean, like right now, if, if, if you go out to a, a Montana lake that is 100 miles away from the nearest car and you uh, go fishing in that lake and you pull out a fish, it has toxic levels of mercury in it. And it has to do with pollution. Just pollution in the air that gets swirled around the whole planet, lands in the water, concentrates in the fish, and now all of our fish globally are toxic. Whereas without the pollution, they would not be toxic. Uh, that, that really upsets me. It really pisses me off. Um, so pollution... And most of our pollution is tied to energy. Um, I planted a lot of seeds earlier this year. This is supposed to be the wettest month of the year, and it's not been. So um, maybe it's just a fluke. Could be climate change. Uh, and, and here in Montana, like in this spot, you could pretty much count on getting 10 below, 30 below every winter. We've had, in the last 10 years, a lot of winters where it didn't get below zero. Um, our gardening season is longer now, 
But then it's like when you try to predict when the rain's going to fall, because when you're trying to grow food without using any irrigation, it's like you're kind of depending on the rainfall. It's like, I know when it will fall, the wettest month of the year. And then it doesn't rain. It's a little frustrating. So that comes from uh, uh, a lot of energy stuff, but it also comes from uh, a lot of our, I, I think it's it's 60%. I think Alan Savory's kind of demonstrated that. Probably a good 60% or more comes from deforestation and, um, and, and poor land management. Um, and we think that it's, you know, human caused based on burr, 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 based on cars and whatever else. And it's like, yeah, that contributes also. So I kind of think about permaculture, we're, we're solving, we're trying to solve all of these things. In energy and, and climate, we've had some great success. Um, right now, we're really focused on the energy question on the cloud, the, because the cloud is actually, as you all know, is not actually in the sky, and it's not actually clean. It's not like a beautiful, uh, those beautiful white clouds on a be be uh, blue day. No, think of dirty gray clouds, uh, because all of the internet all of the internet service companies, you know, our beloved Googles and Facebooks and so on and so forth, um, they've got huge server farms um, that use a lot of energy and a lot of water, and they need to be leaders in um, making sure that um, the, that, that energy is carbon free and that they're being good um, stewards of water and good community stewards. Many of the major companies have ma made um, commitments to be um, climate neutral with their, their um, server farms. Uh, one of the big laggards is actually Amazon. So we've got a lot of attention focused on Amazon right now um, as uh, one of the biggest and dirtiest of the cloud, uh, make, makers of dirty clouds. Um, so um, last year we asked them, they, believe it or not, didn't even have a sustainability director. In this day and age, for a major company to not have a sustainability director, I mean, that is beyond ridiculous. Um, but uh, thanks to the, the thanks to everybody out there who signed our petitions and put pressure on Amazon, uh, Amazon now has a sustainability director. That sustainability director has their work cut out for him for himself. Um, but he's trying to move the company now to make more commitments to go uh, carbon neutral on all their energy for the server farms. And they've just started that, but they still need to hear from everybody that they need to go 100% um, carbon free. So we just hit the two-year mark. Or I mean, we're barely getting started. And I think that most permaculture people, when they get to a new piece of land, that they're going to be thinking about just what am I going to do on my piece of land? And, and being obsessed with gardening, as I think most permaculture people are, I think the first thing they're going to do is start putting in food systems. However, my mission's a little different. I've got I'm, 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 I don't know, wrestling with what I see as some of the big global problems. And I desperately want to solve everything all at once, but it's like something's got to come first. So we've not put a lot of effort into food systems here. And instead, we've put a lot of effort into the big experiments that I think will make the biggest impact on the world. Uh, rocket mass heaters, because more than half half of all home energy use is for heat. And, and so basically a rocket mass heater, if you buy all the wood, it reduces uh, your expense for heat, your energy. I mean, it, it, it eliminates all of the, the natural gas or electricity that you would use for heat. Um, and, and then you've, you're going out, you're gonna go buy wood. But let's say that you just, you know, they use so little wood to heat your home that a lot of people heat their homes with nothing but the twigs that naturally fall off the trees in their yard. Uh, one guy heated his home all winter with nothing but junk mail. Um, I mean, this is, this is a very profound impact on, on our energy footprint globally. And, and so, you know, wherever there's war and pollution going on in the name of energy, what a massive impact it could have. So... A lot of the experimentation going right into the rocket mass heater stuff. And I think we've made massive progress in that space. Um, we've got the, the, the teepee with the rocket mass heater in it, and then the couple that stayed in there. And then, you know, the, the fire goes out. They wake up in the morning. It's 26 below outside. Um, and uh, uh, they were comfortable. There had been no fire. 
but the, and the, the teepee, of course, is an uninsulated structure. So we're demonstrating how it's a very different kind of heat. And you can be very comfortable in an uninsulated space. So we're kind of solving some, some pretty huge things here. Then the Wafati. I mean, you know, in case you kind of feel like, oh, with a rocket mass heater, I still got to go outside and pick up those twigs and bring them inside and, and start a fire once in a while. Um, but with the Wafati, the idea is, is that you can have a home where it uses the heat from the summer to heat through the winter. So again, even greater energy savings. Um, we have uh, uh, hot water from a compost pile. Um, and uh, um, man, I could talk about that for ages. Um, we're spending enormous amounts of money on sewage treatment plants. And it's like, at the same time, we're looking at a potential of, of peak phosphorus. Uh, we, we might find ourselves where it's like, our, our soils are so depleted of nutrients that, you know, some, some of the foods that we eat might not be able to grow because we've mined all the phosphorus and then at the same time we've taken the phosphorus into our bodies and then flushed them and then they go to the oceans. And so we're just filling the oceans up with phosphorus. But, you know, and, and so it's like we've, we've come up with better systems for um, managing human outputs. One of the things that we worked that we've been working on actually for 15 years is um, a group that works on solar energy. We started when solar was only 0.001% of the energy mix, so not very much. And some people said, "Oh, it was impossible," and we said, "Oh, no, 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 it can't be impossible. We need solar if we want a renewable energy future. Solar has a role to play, and we need it. So we have to make sure it can it can um, you know emerge and thrive." And so all of these people got together to. To, to try to figure out how we could um, advance solar um, and make it um, m more cost effective so more and more people could do it. And that required a lot of collaboration. Um, it required um, incentives from the federal government. Um, some states took the lead, like um, um, California and New Jersey, for example. So it took a lot of collaboration with, with, with um, uh, individuals, um, NGOs, you know, nonprofit organizations, activist organizations, governments, um, businesses, um, uh, the National Renewable Energy Lab, the academics, all of us, all of us, no matter, I, what I always say is no matter where you work, no matter what platform you work from, whether it's from your home, whether it's from a government agency, whether it's from a business, whether it's from a nonprofit, w there are ways we can collaborate together to get these system changes. One of the advantages about um, solar powering your school, is, in case you are ever thinking of doing that, um, is that uh, starting a school, it's wise to build one slowly, at least in, in an area like ours that's remotely rural. So we were able to, uh, the way that s solar panels work is you get as many as you can to start something up. And then as you add more facilities and more power uh, uses, you add more solar panels and more batteries and more inverters. So we have gone through a growth process many, many times in which we have gotten to a level uh, of our building where we would need more solar power. So we'd add more solar panels and more batteries, and then we'd need more room. So we'd add more room, and then we'd need more batteries and more solar panels, and we just keep doing that. And along the way, we decided we should have some backup to that, so we developed our wind turbines. We have five wind turbines, only th three of which work, uh, right now because um, technology has still to catch up with this growing desire among people around the world to have alternative energy or more sustainable energy. So it, it's been a process of gradual growth. We, um, as we said before, we didn't come into this with uh, a whole pot of money and we had to build as we could. So part of 
what we've learned with solar power too is we got beyond a certain stage and we had to become industrial strength. So that required us to jump to a whole new level of inverters and, and uh, a much more sophisticated design. We had to go from 24 volt system to 48 volt system and uh, then we had to increase the voltage coming into our inverters to 480 volts to be more efficient. So all of these things we've learned along the way. Uh, but I guess the most important lesson is that it can be done. <laughs> and we're evidence that it can be done because we not only have enough power for our school, but we have a beautiful little school and um, and we are living in our dream. So in order for us to be sustainable we've developed appropriate technologies basically so they help us to preserve food, to cook food and these are things that we can make ourselves as well as purchase from different places. So one thing that we've made is a solar dehydrator. It's a really large um, dehydrator that it harvests the sun and it draws air from underneath the cabinet to go through this solar panel that we made out of a used a sliding glass door and just metal underneath so it creates heat that way and it pulls up the air and then pulls it actually down through the dehydrating food through the use of a solar chimney and it so it pulls the hot air down through the food and then up through this chimney and we're able to um, put in at least like 60 pounds of fruit at a time so during harvest season when, um, and we don't grow all that much fruit here, but in our general area, we can glean and buy, you know, trade fruit from different places. And so when it's late summer, fall, um, I have a practice of getting fruit from wherever I can and slicing it up and filling the dehydrator. And um, at, in three days, all of that stuff will be dried and then I store it up for winter and I have dried fruit all winter to either cook with or just eat straight. Um, so the, the parabolic cooker really helps us to cook with the sun immensely. It's a hot cooker. So it's a solar cooker that it reflects the light onto the pot in the middle and it can even get up to 500 degrees and it can boil uh, water so you can make rice and soup and things like that. It can also um, cook solid things like squash or meats or a casserole and um, but it can burn as well so you have to manage this like you would like a stovetop. Um, but that's that's been essential for us here for um, for our solar cooking. And then the slow cooker we use the, the solar wall oven style slow cooker and it actually has a door in the back so you can install it into the south wall of your house and just open the door and access your food without having to go outside. Or you can put it on a, um, on a swivel chair and just have it allow it to track the sun, you know, face it towards the sun during the day. And so it's a slow cooker and just like a crock pot, you can cook a lot of things in there. You can cook, you know, a lasagna, um, enchiladas, beans, you know, there's a, there's a lot of different ways you can cook in the slow cooker. Um, we also use a, um, we use jars that are painted black for pressure cooking. So that can get to much higher temperatures, but these slow cookers, they, they get up to 275 and not really above. So it'll take a little longer than your normal kind of conventional oven, but it will never burn. So you can actually just put something in the oven and face it south and go away for the day and come back and your food is done. I think I've had a passion for a long time uh, about finding more sustainable ways of living. It's something that um, I think I, I found a passion for even when I was in college. 
But um, I think what really got me committed to it is when we moved out to our ranch in 1990. Um, and our ranch was in this beautiful, beautiful area of the Painted Desert, and there were absolutely no power lines around and no water lines, and we decided we could live there. So we started living off the grid with solar power and um, gathered water off our roof for our drinking and, and using for other reasons. And, it easily uh, showed us that we could live a really wonderful lifestyle by being off the grid. So passive solar design is a way that we can harvest the sun and use it during the winter to heat our homes. And so we do that through like an attached greenhouse it helps us heat our main home. Also, we have clear story windows and we can design overhangs above the windows so that the sun comes in in the winter when the sun is, it tracks low on the horizon during the winter. And then just the way that it's a beautiful way the earth works, the, the sun goes high in the summer. So you can build an overhang so that the sun is, there's a shaded area and the sun will not come into your window in the summer. So just through the design of the house, you can make sure it stays warm in the winter and cool in the summer. And then also through using thermal mass. So thermal mass is, uh, we use water often, but also it can be adobe or earth or stone. And that's a way you can absorb the heat of the sun and hold it inside your environment to radiate back out during the evening. You know, I remember when we first, uh, 1976, we had wind generators and we murdered a tree. You know, we were doing with redwoods and different, and it's huge, it's huge. Somebody climbs to the top, we, we attach the generator on it, and it's got these lines so the tree doesn't blow over. And we did pretty well for a year, we were generating and then a big storm came over and of course you got a propeller up there with your, it blew right off. But that's the way it is, you know? And we begin to look at how, how do we do this in a practical way? And so we live in the desert, we have straw bale. All our construction is straw bale. So we've got a little expertise at that. And we have a variety of straw bale, uh, post beam straw bale, stack straw bale, whatever, different ways. Why? What's that have to do with the desert? Well, straw bale is a huge insulator. So it's cooler in the summer and it holds the, uh, the heat of the winter and we don't really need much to make it work in terms of you don't need, I mean people get, want to have an air conditioner but you get by with swamp coolers or whatever. My point is, again, we're building structures that are appropriate for living in the desert. So, you know, where you live is, is key to what kind of agri, you know, structure you use. A personal home is what we call rammed earth. That's, um, I think, probably even better than straw bale uh, because it has more mass to it and therefore it, it has more R value. So you got the insulation both ways. So, but the point is, this is what we're looking at for optimum structures in that particular location. So everything we've done uh, is very much kind of geared the best we can living in this world to interface in a good way, energetically and ecologically. Let's, let's keep a couple things in mind. Uh, if a septic system, which is what, when you live out, off grid and in the country uh, is, is what is usually recommended. If it's good, why is it when you, you get enough people all living close to each other that they say you're not allowed to use your septic system anymore? You are now legally required to hook up to our sewage treatment plant system. So why do they do that unless, of course, they don't work as well as would be optimal? They're, they're, they're less than perfect. And, and so, and it's true, they are. They, you know, they, they, they do pretty good, but they're still, let's say, 
poop Kool-Aid that works its way down into our drinking water. And, um, you know, now that I've said it out loud, I think a lot of people are kind of like, oh no, I'm drinking poop Kool-Aid. Uh, I don't want that. So, and uh, um, granted, when you have enough people living together, then that uh, flavor comes through a little bit more. And if your people are spread out more, well, you don't get as much of that flavor and you might not notice it so much. And, and so then you start to think to yourself, do I really want to drink really weak poop Kool-Aid? Or do I want to come up with something better? So then you start thinking about sewage treatment plants. But if you go and you visit your sewage treatment plant and learn all about how it works, um, uh, they're going to say, okay, and, and here's the part where we dump a bunch of it into the river. And uh, you mean the river that I go floating in and I go fishing in and stuff like that? And it's like, so we took the poop Kool-Aid out of our drinking water and made it somebody else's problem. And, and it's kind of like, um, that doesn't seem really good either. So, you know, and it's like, don't worry though, it's all okay. We did shit to it. <laughs> and it's like, uh, um, okay, well, um, somehow I'm still worried. And, uh, and I'm going to say that I've done some study in that space. And I have concerns. So there's a, a multifaceted thing here. And so one of it is, is that, you know, why do we have... Uh, septic tanks, sewage treatment plants, all this stuff. What's, what's our goal? And a, a big part of it is, is like, we, we don't want to get sick. I mean, there's, if there's somebody within our community who is sick and they're pooping, and then like um, that ends up as poop Kool-Aid and what we drink, or if that, if a fly goes over and lands on it and gets all that sick all over it and comes and lands on our food, then, oh man, we can all get really sick. And that's not okay. Um, and so what can we come up with? What, what's, what's going to be our solution? So solution one, let's, can we come up with something that's cleaner than a sewage treatment plant or a septic system? And, and so I believe yes. At the same time, it's kind of like, okay, we have all these nutrients come out of our body and do we want them to go to the ocean or because it's, it's exactly the same stuff that we need on our crops. So it's like, okay, we've got to solve the problem so that we can get it onto our crops, but it has to be 100% safe. And when I say 100% safe, I'm not talking about 99.99. I'm talking about 100.000000% safe. It's like, all right, so how do we do this? So the system that we have now is that, first of all, urine um, is for all practical purposes, sterile. Now, notice how I qualified that as for all practical purposes. So, um, I mean, there are little loopholes in there and, and it's like, you know, but those loopholes are mitigated. We've got them 100% mitigated for all practical purposes. If you go and you pee on a spot outside, let's say you just did that, that's totally okay. I mean, there's, there's some, place, some ways to make it better or worse. And then let's say somebody is out parading around barefoot and seven seconds later, they step on that. And, um, and, here's, and I'm saying now, safe. That's okay. Might be like a little bit ew, but there's, there's no danger because it's the poop where there are the pathogens that we need to be concerned about. And um, I have a crazy theory, and I could be mistaken, but at the moment, this is what I put in my head, and I'm just going to stick to it until I get confirmation that it's true or false or something in between or whatever. But I believe that while poop has the pathogens in it, that I believe that urine is like Purina pathogen chow. So you don't want them together. You want to kind of keep them apart as much as you can. So um, we've got a system set up where it collects the poop and the urine is diverted. And we, you know, we ask everybody to go P 
pee outside all over things. And um, uh, then we're going to take the poop. And there's like so many different ways that we can, um, I, I want to use the word process it, uh, but, but it's really like process doesn't seem like a good word either, to do from that point. Plan A. And I think this will be our long-term plan for most of the stuff because this is, this is returning things to uh, where you can use it. Plan A is going to be um, to let it sit for two years. Because if anybody's sick, pooped in there, in two years, whatever those pathogens are, they're gone. Chances are, considering you know 20 different people and running the numbers and stuff like that, chances are, in five to six months, they're gone. And in a year, like you're really sure. But in two years, you're really, 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 really sure. So now it's very, very safe. And uh, then we take this material that's left. It'll look like compost. And you put it at the base of, uh, of a tree species that we call poop beasts. These are trees, most trees, most plants. You give them this much... Um, uh, material, this much, um, uh, let's say, fertilizer, and, and it's too much. Ah! They, they, they can't cope. It's, they can't deal with it. But uh, cottonwoods and willow trees and poplars, uh, they, they can just, they, it's like they'll stick a straw in it and chug a lug, you know, no problem. And then suddenly the tree goes big. <laughs> and so, now, and these are not food species. So basically we're going to turn this material into a, a woody species and, and it'll turn it into wood. And, and then you can, you know, maybe uh, 50 years later that tree will fall over and we will plant food species in it or something like that. And that's, you know, this is, this is nature's design really. But we've now, this is a system I believe that is vastly superior to a sewage treatment plant, which is vastly superior to a septic tank system. Um, and, and at the same time, we're returning nutrients into our food systems. And it's a long path, but I think this is, this is tremendously superior to everything else. And some of the things I worked on was um, uh, I, I helped uh, start a tree planting organization where we planted uh, uh, endangered oak trees in Pasadena and um, helped host the first, uh, one of the largest Earth Day festivals called the Royal Seco Earth Day Festival, festival in Pasadena. We had over 40,000 people. Um, and uh, I attended the second international permaculture conference uh, and learned a lot of, about permaculture and then hosted a permaculture conference in the Bay Area in 1987. And, um, and then that led uh, to living up in Mendocino County on an old homestead, uh, sol solar off the grid. And one of the things I noticed is they were destroying a lot of the forests. So I became a, a, uh, a concerned about why we were destroying all the forests. And, you know, we used to have great, um, you know, healthy forests in, in the Pacific Northwest. And because we've been clear cutting for so many years, you know, slowly the soil gets washed away. And, and um, I became a forest activist and helped try to pass an initiative in 1990. We raised six million, the timber industry spent 50 million, so lost, lost that campaign. And <clears throat> kind of a repeat of, of what happened in, in 2012 for the GMO initiative. Um, but we educated people in the process and, and um, uh, then I decided to find out how, if we're not gonna destroy our forest to build houses, what are we gonna use, what are we, what's the fiber we're gonna build houses? And that's where I discovered about uh, industrial hemp. And hemp is a great, you can build amazing houses, um, non-load bearing walls. Uh, you basically combine the short fibers with uh, lime and water. And, and uh, there's over three or 4,000 homes that have been built this way. They're very energy efficient. They breathe really well. It, um, so, uh, and, it, and there's no toxic off gassing. So it's, and you can also use them to remodel houses. So as America starts to, to grow more hemp, we're just starting that in Colorado and Kentucky now, hopefully we'll be growing more, more hemp and, and build hemp houses. And of course the hemp seed is one of the most nutritious seeds in the world, rich in omega-3 and protein and, and also magnesium, zinc and iron and, 
it's one of the highest sources of magnesium, which is a master mineral. Over 300 biochemical processes in the body require magnesium, and the vast majority of Americans are short in it. So, so hemp's, hemp's a great, great nutritious uh, food, and we need to grow it here in America. It's, the, it's one of the only industrialized countries where it's not legal to grow hemp in all 50 states. If somebody wants to move towards permaculture and homesteading, and they want to get out of the rat race, I think we've now made it 10 times easier for people because there's just so much stuff that either people just generally didn't know before permies.com or things that we've come up with collectively, uh, new things. I, I think we're making it magnificent. I, I, the, the rocket mass heater is one example of what we've done so far. Um, I mean, so few people knew about that, and now we've not only optimized and improved the design dramatically through permies.com, but we've uh, uh, also connected more brains to it, so more people know about it and know how to make them safely and make them better. So now you can heat your home with one-tenth the wood of a conventional wood stove, which when you're going off-grid or you're going to do homesteading, wood heat is the traditional form of heat, mostly because it's kind of hard to find propane in the wild. You know, you, you go looking around on the ground and you just don't see it, uh, or electricity or natural gas, but woody bits, you can find those. And now we sit inside of a Wafati that isn't yet complete, but we hope to complete it. And can we make it, I don't know, I guess, I guess mathematically, can we make it infinitely better, which would be now you don't need any heat whatsoever. The, the, the home is heated by itself and stays comfortable all year by holding in the heat from the summer and carrying that through to the winter. An experiment. If it works, won't that be awesome? So we do a barter here once a month. And the barter, the only rules of the barter are no cash allowed, and it has to be something that, you, that you're bartering. Anything you bring to barter has to be related to sustainability. So, you know, no microwaves or TVs or anything like that, and can, no cash allowed. So that, and it teaches you how to uh, kind of socially engineer too. I might have something that you want, but you don't have what I want, so you've got to go barter with somebody else to get something that I want back to here. And so we get these little networks and chains uh, started. And this is social economy. This is the economy that we should be working with. Small scale economies. Uh, there was a woman who started, a, an economist who, who got the Nobel Peace Prize on this back in the 90s, and I forget her name. But the concept was, if you'd read it, it was absolutely genius and brilliant and yet incredibly simple at the same time. Small scale economies where we, we work with, a, with, a, with just our local people, our local community, and then, and then we slowly work outside of that for the things that we, we just can't get because of our eco zone or our biome or wherever we're living perhaps. So that all pulls us back into understanding, hey, if we have a hard time you know, growing tomatoes here or whatever, you know, we have a hard time with this, this particular resource here, but we understand the soil and why we can't do that. Where on the planet do they not have a problem with it? Or what have they done over in this community to be able to kind of artificially uh, emulate nature in order to be able to do that? What can I learn from that? And what can I learn about the earth in that portion? So it actually draws us as a community of caretakers together in these, you know, across these uh, resources that we need, not only just knowledge from each other, but uh, but the actual you know physical resources that we get from it. Another system that we're working on researching, and, and, and of course calories, so a lot of people always are focusing on, you know, the garden, they think of the garden as lettuce and tomatoes, and that's nice, but what we really are interested in ultimately at the end of the day is calories, especially if we undergo economic collapse, the new currency, whatever it is, will ultimately be based on calories. Uh, and so we have, uh, we've been working for a long time with growing potatoes and tires. Potatoes are one of the few plants that you can keep piling up and piling up and piling up and it'll keep growing and producing more of the potatoes in them. Tires are an amazing resource that's free. <laughs> they're around forever. They're, they're, we need to reuse them in some way. We've been doing lots of experiments. We've had lots of failures. Uh, in fact, um, you know, most of our failures have, we've published on the GROW Network and now we're at this point where we've, we've pretty much got it successfully. So here at Green America, we look at the meta strategies of system change to, to plan our work and work with others. Um, and um, there's, a, there's a system change um, 
perspective of, of what the metasystem strategies are that came out of um, the Rakana Institute and um, Meg Wheatley, um, folks who do wonderful work in thinking about um, how do we create better worlds for all of us. And so th they identify five meta strategies. And what I mean by a meta strategy is, you know, big picture things that have to happen. There's many strategies inside of them, like, you know, there's education strategies and legal strategies and marketplace strategies like what we do here at Green America. Lots and lots of, there's, there's you know, lobbying strategies, political strategies, policy strategies, all kind of strategies. But all of those strategies are organized into, into five meta or big picture strategies. Um, the fir what, and, and these are not, a, they all, they, we have to do all of them simultaneously, but um, the, the, the first one I'll note is what we call um, stopping the damage or stopping the destruction. Um, sometimes here at Green America we call it the, the saying no or the no energy. You know, you've got to stop the damage, you've got to stop the suffering. Um, say no to climate change, say no to fossil fuels, say um, no to, to, to slavery and supply change. No, 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 stop that. Um, so that's, that's one of the meta strategies, stopping the bad stuff. Um, the next of the big meta strategies is um, the new solutions. Well, if we're going to say no to the bad stuff, what are we going to say yes to? So what's not only the vision of what we need to, to be going, going to, what the journey is to something better, but what we're doing right now today in practical ways, what are the solutions? Organic agriculture, renewable energy, um, uh, local, local economic systems, all those kinds of things. What are the new systems, the new integrative health systems, the, in every field, um, in every field, there are new su just and sustainable solutions that we can, we can bring up, we can bring to scale. And so that's a really important meta strategy, bringing on the new solutions. Now, as everybody learns the destructive parts of the old systems and the fact that there are new systems coming up, then there's another meta strategy that comes in, which is how do you transition from the old to the new? You know, what are the incentives? Um, how, do you, how do you throw a really great party? Um, you know, we say, oh, what, what's really great about um, being green, you know, just and sustainable, is, is that it's a better party. You know, the food tastes better, the, the communities are more fun. Hey, come on over and um, uh, to, the, to the sustainable side. But there's also um, economic incentives you can put in. There's policy incentives you can put in to get people to shift from one to another. Um, one of the things that I like to talk about in terms of climate change is that um, thanks to a lot of great work and a lot of collaboration um, with a lot of nonprofit organizations and government organizations and cities and states, um, there, are, um, there are no more new coal plants being um, built in our country and the, there's old coal plants being closed down um, and um, the, even the marketplace sees that there's no future in coal because the, there's been a complete collapse in the price of coal companies like Peabody Coal. Their, their stock price has gone from, from high to almost zero in, in fewer than five years. So we're seeing the collapse of the coal companies. Well, and there's only about 80,000 80, coal miners left. Most of them are over 55 years old. They have spent a lifetime of service. They risk their lives, they risk their health. Um, to help other people have energy. It's time to thank them for their service. It's time to give them um, uh, a really good retirement plan and a good health care plan because many of them are pretty sick. Um, and it's time to just close down that coal, coal, coal industry. W you say, so that's an example of a transition strategy. Take care of the people in the transition. Maybe some of them will get new jobs in the new renewable energy industry. Maybe some of them will just, it's time for them to, to get a really nice retirement package. Um, uh, certainly the coal companies have an obligation to do that retirement package um, and if um, uh, the coal companies are completely shut down well then uh, we could pick them up and give them a, um, we could thank them for the service and give them a military benefit package for both retirement and, and health um, and it would cost only a drop in the bucket in terms of our um, military uh, obligations which are very important. Um, so, so those are examples of transition strategies. As you're closing down the old, you're bringing up the new, that gives you the chance to say, hey, come on over. Um, so the third of the meta strategies is transition strategies. The fourth that many, many people participate in, and I you know, salute everyone out there who's an educator, um, is to, um, to educate um, and, and nurture the culture change. So it's music, it's culture, it's education, it's, it's media, it's social media, it's all the things that tell the new stories, that tell the stories about the destruction of the old system 
and the solutions that we have at our fingertips right now to do the new things that everyone every day can participate in the new systems. So please come and join us. So everyone doing that education, whether it's in, in, it's in schools or on social media, wherever it is, um, that education is an important meta strategy. It changes the culture, it changes the mindset. It's very important. And then the, and then fi the final meta strategy is to nurture the new leadership the new collaborative leadership, the new, the new ways of thinking, the new ways of working together that are going to run the new systems, the new solutions that, we're br that everyone is working together to bring up. So that, that's kind of how we think here at Green America, think about the system change. And here at Green America, we focus um, on strategies that serve the stop the destruction when it comes to the, the what, what, do, um, what does the uh, corporate com corporate world do to cause destruction, let's get that stopped, let's buy some time to bring up the new solutions. And let's recognize that we're not saying business is bad, we're saying let's put that business in engine on the right journey. Let's, let's, let's create the new solutions and, st and stop doing it the old way, let's do it the new way. Um, so that's what we focus on here at Green America. Um, but what we think about, of all, but we think about these, uh, these meta strategies are really important because everyone what we encourage everyone to do is work on the strategy, the meta strategy that you're best at that speaks to your heart. Um, you know, do what you love and say, you know what, I really love um, uh, doing organic gardening. Um, I'm going to be part of that strategy. Other people say, hey, I'm really great at social media. I can make really cool videos. Well, we'll do that. You know, um, um, but recognize all the different people who are your allies and, and don't waste energy on trying to convince people that there's only one way or that this strategy is better than that strategy. D don't spend that because we know from the ecosystem that the most biodiverse ecosystems are the ones that thrive the best. Well, if we want to change systems from destructive to nourishing and restorative, it's the same principle. The biodiversity, a diversity of strategies is what's going to do it. So do what you love, recognize your allies, and don't use your energy trying to convince somebody else that, one's, that one good strategy is better than another good strategy. Um, let's all work together and collaborate on bringing forward a more just and sustainable world. We started a uh, small not-for-profit uh, called the International Preparedness Network and became a, a, a what you call a community NGO, non-governmental organization. And we teach civilians and professionals how to mitigate against, respond to, recover from the full range of all the different types of disasters, natural, technological, environmental, civil, cyber, um, in the, the whole range. And, um, and I got into it because you know, I saw that there was a need for it many, many years ago, even when I was in college and, and uh, studying engineering. And I felt that that a lot of holes that uh, we've never patched up in the system in terms of vulnerabilities that they were going to plague us in the future. So I just said, you know, we needed to set up systems, some sort of a system for people to, to actually, since it didn't exist at the time, all it was was FEMA. You know, when, when Zbigniew Brzezinski started it, it was this mechanism that the government had set up to deal with these natural disasters and catastrophes. But, you know, it's become this huge bureaucracy that, as you know, that the wheels of a bureaucracy turn slowly. And, and, and to a, for a large degree, when we started the IPN, um, there was a need that people needed to learn about these uh, disasters. And FEMA had all the information. They had coloring books, they had books. But it was all up in the FEMA offices. It wasn't available to civilians. Civilians didn't even know that this stuff was available to them. So if you wanted a book, you wanted a, a FEMA book to learn how to prepare for a disaster, it's not like FEMA was knocking at your door. Hey, would you like these books to, to help you out? You had to go and find FEMA, and you had to go and pursue it yourself, which doesn't make any sense. Because if the government is supposed to serve you, then that means that they're, at the very least they'll send you the book, because they took your tax money to pay for the books. Mm -hmm. But then they took the tax money, they paid for the books, right? And, and then they take the books that they should distribute, but then they pile them up in warehouses. The book that they wrote and spent money to teach you how to prepare for disasters, but you don't know that that book exists because they don't bring it to you or they don't send it to you in the mail for free. But they, so this is the, this is the mindset of a government. So now we got 320 million people in this country and we have a number of different disasters that are coming. 
you know, catastrophes that we're not prepared for, just outright. We're just not prepared for anything. I was just talking to a friend who's a scientist who is speaking to me about the fact that we have a number of different nuclear power facilities that are about to cycle out. They've aged out. They're 50 years old. You know, um, They're all over the country. We have right here, we're in New York. We have the Indian Point facility right now in Buchanan, New York, 35 miles away. If it melted down, what are we going to do? The entire city and 50-mile radius. It's just like everybody in what's, in what's called the peak injury area is going to have to evacuate. You'd have to evacuate a greater part of New York State. So what are we talking about here when we talk about, you know, preparedness? Preparedness for, you know, how can you prepare for that? Do you, do you store 20 years of food in your basement? Um, it, what, what happens if you live within the peak injury zone of a Chernobyl-type accident? Well, we know we're going to see that in the future. You know, we have the Yellowstone caldera. We, we, have, we might be in a period where the, what you call, global geophysical event, a, a supervolcano may erupt. It's, it's, there's all sorts of things. That we, look, in 2012, we, we, we just missed getting hit from the energy from a huge solar flare. Just missed it. And if it had hit the Earth, we're talking about uh, something similar to an event in 1859 called the Carrington Event, where we uh, had a tremendously powerful solar flare, released an enormous amount of energy, so much energy that, in fact, the people in the Caribbean thought it was daylight, just from the Aurora Borealis effect. Uh, there were telegraph stations that actually shorted out, caught fire, set fires all across the country. If we had that happen today, we'd lose all of our comm satellites, all of our communication satellites. The internet, a lot of, a lot of the server parks would fry. Our ability to communicate, I mean, you're talking about basically, to a large degree, certain areas of the country would be thrown back into almost like a Stone Age type of existence. People wouldn't even be able to get gas out of gas tanks underground because there are no electrical pumps to do it. Medical systems, 72 hours. Then the generators run out of power in the three days. But you can't deliver more diesel fuel. You can't get the fuel out of the pumps. It's absolute chaos, just like what happened in New York when there was Hurricane Sandy. And you had cars online looking for gasoline. They couldn't even get gasoline to fill up the car because they couldn't get into the pumps. They had to have the National Guard actually come out and guard some of the gas stations just from people who were desperate from gas. So what we have a system, and people, when they talk about I'm a prepper, it's good Prepping is part of the you know, solution, at least being independent, but prepping for what? Because we have several catastrophes that we are headed straight towards, and we're not even interested in engaging in the activities that we need to do as human beings to at least try to minimize or stop them. So we, we, we ask for war, we, we're belligerent, we, we, uh, we're engaged right now in a situation that can inflame it to a huge conflict, and in, in a modern-day large conflict, where does that end? With chemical weapons, with biological weapons, with nuclear weapons? We're the transition generation. If we don't figure out another way, it might be too late by the time our kids are grown up. They won't have the same kind of options. But right now, I can rent a bulldozer and build a pond. It's, it's not that difficult. And design water catchment and storage to, as we move into drought. Oh, no problem. We'll just take the water when is abundant in the winter and then release it over the summer when it's dry. Um, you know, or take the time to like, okay, we can go buy nursery pots and get thousands of trees started so then we can perpetuate this idea and, you know, replicate this model um, while resources are, are still fairly abundant. I grew up on a diverse, very sweet little diverse farm where we had, you know, a few head of beef cattle and couple of pigs and lots of chickens. I mean, we were a chicken farm and nothing left the farm basically. We, everything was cradle to cradle. I hope people have heard of that term. When, I'll explain it briefly. You have a tablecloth, it gets holes in it, it gets soiled, you can't get it clean anymore, you cut it up and you make napkins. When they're toast, they become car rags or rags to wipe up the floor because we didn't use paper towels. And when that's done, they go to the compost pile and they turn back into dirt. I mean, it's such a simple system. There isn't any away. You know, it goes through a circle right there on our little farm. And we didn't need to buy fertilizer. We had chickens, pigs, you know, they fertilize stuff. 
and it's, because, it's from the food we raised for them. So we know from stem to stern, everything's cool. The pigs had a quart, half an acre, half an acre pen. They had trees in their pen. They had a house, you know? Pigs are so smart that they picked the lowest point in the pen to use as their bathroom. They would get up in the middle of the night, go to the bathroom. They never, ever went to the bathroom anywhere but that one place in the pen, generation after generation. So my father put a gate, would back in the manure spreader, dig the pile they'd left, take it and spread it on <laughs> the land. And it was just a circle of life. It, it was just, that's what I want. I want my grandchildren to know that, to, to have dirty fingernails, to go out and pick something out of the garden and eat it without washing it. I want them to be able to do that and not worry about it, not be afraid of it. We live, this whole hierarchical system is based on fear. It wouldn't be possible if we weren't all allowing fear in our lives. Now, how do you change that? I change it by, I don't lock my doors. I don't lock my car, I don't lock my house, I don't lock anything. Now, people say, you're crazy. You know, people will steal all the stuff that you've spent such a hard time building. Maybe so. Maybe somebody really needs it more than I do. It does not define me, and that's a very difficult thing to do, but at the same time, it's so liberating. Losing our fear is the most wonderful thing, and of course, there are many, many things you can do to lose your fear more. You can do meditation, you can do yoga, you can do um, karate training, <laughs> if you have the right teacher um, who does not emphasize attack, but the creating a space around you that is like a shield, that is the me, the greater I, not the ego, but the greater I, connected to the, to the universe, connected to the cosmic powers. That is I. And if I have that sense and walk down the street, it doesn't matter that people have guns and knives and um, I mean, in America, everybody would be, should be dying of fear because this is the most armed country in the world. But for some reason, we think when we have one ourselves, we don't have to be fearful. But of course, it actually shows that we are very fearful. I do not own a gun. I never want to have a gun in my house. It is not something that I even would consider. And that means losing our fear allowing our children to lose their fear. Our children do not need to fear their parents, they do not need to fear their teachers, and we have begun that process with attachment parenting, with all those little things that you can change in your life. When we think about collaborating for a more just and sustainable society, that means everyone and every organization and every institution. So schools, hospitals, businesses, governments, um, we can all collaborate together for, um, for more justice and sustainability. Um, here at Green America, we actually have a program that we call the Center for Sustainability Solutions that brings whole supply chains and whole systems together to do what we can do together that no one person, no one company, no one government could do alone. So um, let me give you an example. One of the things that, we worked, that we've been working on actually for 15 years is um, a group that works on solar energy. We started when solar was only 0.001% of the energy mix. So not very much and some people said, oh, it was impossible. And we said, oh, no, 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 it can't be impossible. We need solar if we want a renewable energy future. Solar has a role to play and we need it. So we have to make sure it can, it can um, you know, emerge and thrive. And so, all of these people got together to, to, to try to figure out how we could um, advance solar um, and make it um, m more cost effective so more and more people could do it. And that required a lot of collaboration. Um, it required um, incentives from the federal government. Um, some states took the lead, like um, um, California and New Jersey, for example. So it took a lot of collaboration with, with, with um, uh, individuals, um, 
NGOs, you know, nonprofit organizations, activist organizations, governments, um, businesses, um, uh, the National Renewable Energy Lab, the academics, all of us, all of us, no matter, I, what I always say is no matter where you work, no matter what platform you work from, whether it's from your home, whether it's from a government agency, whether it's from a business, whether it's from a nonprofit, w there are ways we can collaborate together to get these system changes. And so it's gonna take every single one of us from all corners of the globe coming together and deciding and taking action on implementing these new systems in place, whether it's through lobbying, new legislation, to creating new community engagement activities and social responsibility programs, teaching these kinds of methods, building methods, community methods, system methods in schools, and simply getting involved in every way we can in our own local environment, our own local communities, and our own local government and politics to make these changes. So it's up to you, it's up to me. We have the power, we have the ability, and all we have to do is go out there each day and do something that's gonna make a positive difference for the future of our civilization and the future for the sustainability of the planet. So thank you again for tuning in to this episode. I'm so grateful you're a part of our community. And let's go out and make a difference.